This is Michael Aaron of NJN News. It is the morning of August 7th, 2006. We're at Eagleton Institute to have our second interview with John Degnan, who was Executive Secretary to Governor Byrne in the first term and later Attorney General in the second Byrne uh, administration. We're going to pick up where we left off in the first interview, which was a discussion of getting the income tax passed. We talked somewhat about uh, the income tax and how it dominated the first term, and we talked about some of the personalities in the legislature that you dealt with. Uh, let's pick it up by talking about how you got the income tax passed. How did it finally... You know, an actual threatened closing, and the governor leveraged that, as he did tried to do several times before into a um, special session of the legislature and uh, at least a few days, if I'm recalling correctly, in maybe August, I remember it being very hot and, uh, and the legislature actually having to stay overnight a couple of nights. Um, I, I don't recall sitting here exactly what the breakthrough uh, commitment was in terms of a vote. But, you know, we were always a handful of votes shy of the income tax at various times, assuming that the commitments made to the governor in the privacy of his office would ultimately translate into a vote on the floor of the Assembly and the Senate, which you never had a great degree of confidence they would. Um, but my memory fails me for exactly how and who made the pivotal difference. But it was the Supreme Court saying that the schools can't open because of unequal funding and the state has to do something to equalize the funding that that finally tipped the balance? Well, y yes, and I mean, going back to the beginning of the debate, it really was school funding that created the, uh, listen, the income tax needed to be passed in New Jersey irrespective of school funding, in my judgment. Everybody who was thoughtful about the economics of the state understood that. But the political reality was there needed to be someone to assign responsibility for the act. And the court uh, seemed willing to participate in that way. Uh, I think on, on the merits, their constitutional analysis is correct and um, that the manner in which education was funded in New Jersey was unconstitutional and didn't provide a thorough and efficient education. But the court was also politically astute to know that they needed to allow the legislature time to um, adapt to that and to do the right thing. What then followed was a progression of sort of stepping up the pressure with each opinion being a little more insistent and defining more what needed to be done. Um, and in the end, I think, I often wonder whether there was any collaboration I don't know about between the, uh, we talked a little bit about this on another subject last time, between the governor and the, and the chief on, on this issue, but... Uh, what do you what kind of collaboration might there have been? What, what conversation might have taken place? You know, a, a Chief Justice ought to be concerned about the separation of power and when the court's authority would be uh, disrespected or, or so, uh, so aggressively asserted as to provoke the legislature to be uh, contemptuous of it. I think that's a legitimate role of the Chief Justice. You have to think about those kinds of issues. You have to decide the case on the law and the constitutionality and the right. But in terms of the institutions, um, if I were Chief Justice, you'd have to be conscious of that. And, and I think um, that court was particularly conscious of it and very attentive to uh, when their moral authority would be lost because they would trigger a reaction that would be directed at the court rather than directed at um, how to secure the funding necessary to meet the constitutional mandate. N n if I were the Chief Justice, I'd be trying to learn when that pivotal point was being reached. And one way to do that would be to talk to people. Uh, uh, this is all conjecture on my part. You say that uh, part of getting it passed is having somebody to pin it on or some institution to pin it on. Does it get pinned on the governor or on the Supreme Court, the, the creation of an income tax? Well, I Politically, I think it would, be, would have been nice if it got pinned on the Supreme Court, but no, the governor took the brunt of it. Um, his popularity plummeted. Um, 
it was a, you know, he had a great three or four months in office and then was all downhill after that. Um, and I can remember going to the, uh, it's one of my, the worst pieces of advice I probably ever gave the governor was when he went to open the racetrack at the uh, Meadowlands Sports Authority in, I think it was September. And I believe the income tax was passed in August, where it was right around the time the income tax was going to be implemented. But we had a big debate in the office as to whether the governor ought to go down on the on the track and cut the ribbon, and and um, he was inclined not to do it. He had been to a lot of athletic events. Politicians tended to get booed at, at athletic events under the best of circumstances. And and some of us made the argument that you had to go down. You're the governor. You're identified with the sports complex. We, you know we believe you saved it. Um, you, it's, it's one of the few things that people in New Jersey on polls that we had seen rated as a positive development during his tenure. And he went down and we were all there. And the, not only was the reaction booze, it was almost violent. It was people spitting at him. He had Gene with him and people tried to hit them with placards. And it, by the time the two of them got back up to the suite after they had gone down, um, Gene was extremely upset. And he was, I thought, shaken himself. And, uh, you know, I wondered whether I'd have a job in the morning. <laughs> it was, it would, would, better, would, would have been better had he not gone down. The reaction was that vitriol? Oh, absolutely. You know, d during the, uh, even during the uh, election campaign, particularly the primary, there were, I, I traveled a lot with him, although not every day because my role was to stay in the government. But when I did, <coughs> I was stunned at the, uh, the nastiness and, uh, um, uh, profanity, actually, of people who were uh, waiting as he arrived and left. They often weren't in the meetings. They were often, um, though, alerted to the fact that he was coming and they'd be outside. Who were these people? Um, I, they were, frankly, people outside government who were just frustrated by what they felt was, you know, a decision to pass the cost of law. Um, don't think they understood really the issues um, that led up to the necessity for its passage. And I don't want to I don't want to generalize or characterize them, but they weren't people with real thoughtful opinions about government. They were, but very vocal, and very loud. A few legislators probably knew that their vote <coughs> for the income tax could end their legislative career. Uh, how did you handle those people, do you recall? Well, I didn't, but um, the governor did. Uh, you know, he'd cite a couple of people to you. Herb Klein is one that he often cites Passaic County legislature. And Herb actually did, I think, lose the next uh, election, but voted for the income tax. He dealt with each of them on a one-off basis. Um, the good ones, who were substantive, he'd, he'd make the argument on the merits. Um, the, the ones that he had personal relationships with, he'd make the argument on that basis. The ones that he thought could be influenced by their county chairmen, he'd call the county chairman and, and get them down and meet together with them. Uh, he was his own best counselor about how to approach uh, those folks, in my recollection. Jerry English was you know, a good source of advice for them. She knew the legislature very well. But in the end, I think the governor had good instincts about most of them. Do you think in any instance he had to promise somebody a job uh, if you lose your seat? He, he probably in some instances um, encouraged people to believe that there was an alternative after losing elective office. Uh, having sat in so many meetings with him, I find it hard to believe that he ever said to anyone, I don't think he did, if you lose the election because of this vote, I will ensure that you have a job. Uh, it would come too close to the prohibition on uh, offering someone something of value to influence their legislative judgment. Did you deal personally with the, the question of rounding up votes for the income tax? No, I, 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 I didn't. I, that was At that point where I was in the office, I was more of the uh, person they would turn to to work with the treasurer on the language. I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't as much a political, I was a political advisor, but not not a senior one then. So he'd use me in those substantive meetings, but he probably wouldn't include me in some of the personal meetings. Uh, 
Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Let me get rid of this. Um, I, I can see your eyes go up on it. I know. I'll, I'll turn it for you, uh, you know what? I just turned it off first, though, so okay. it doesn't. Uh, first, I have to unlock the damn thing. I, I, it, you know, it was it was not objectionable, believe me. It wasn't? No, not at all, but I neglected to say. Turn. It should go up there. Thanks. Thanks so much. Did I, have that, did I have that right about the Supreme Court? Was it a shutdown of the schools that yeah, we're threatening? Yeah. It was shutdown for about a year. Yeah. But, but it was a summer, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. He, yeah. Sort of, he sort of answered this, the first, the first part of it a few minutes ago. But I was going to ask, I was going to ask, in retrospect, do you think the court's decision in tying money to equality was right? We're still wrong. Oh, that's an interesting question. I don't. Do you think we, well, should, we did talk well, about that? No, before? no, we didn't. So let's, so okay. what, you're on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in retrospect, uh, do you think the court's decision tying educational equality to spending was correct? I, th I think over time, at least I've become convinced that uh, there's, not a n there's not a necessary um, compelling causation relationship between the amount of money spent and the quality of the education delivered. It's an important factor, but I think in time we've learned a lot more about what really achieves quality schools, quality of the principal and the leadership in the school, the involvement of parents and the motivation that they convey to kids, the, uh, the uh, establishment of, an, of a, the value of schools as a part of the community. And, and those factors, in my mind, are, are um, at least as determinative of the quality of the education as money is. And I think in some ways the court has gotten itself into a box by making it financially based. New Jersey, I think, spends as much or maybe more than any other state on a per capita basis on education. And yet no one would contend that New Jersey's educational outcome is as good as many other states. And one has to ask the question, why? It's the danger of courts I think getting into social engineering, they they really made a decision about quality education that is, you know, more in the realm of um, of educational uh, professionals than it is the court. They did it on the basis of a record where there was a lot of testimony about that, uh, but it's it's right on the edge in my mind of of uh, what a court should do. You sound like a Republican. Uh complaining about uh, court legislating from the bench. You know, I had, a, I had a guy at law school named Archer Bull Cox who had a theory about constitutional law that I still think makes a lot of sense. There are some issues, he used to say, that are incapable of being decided by a court because they go so fundamentally to the values of society or, or the structures of government. Um, and in those areas, he would argue, the court ought to defer to the political process and the legislature to either address them or not address them and over time pay the price for that. You know, I, I don't, I'm not sure in education and, and the cost, meeting the constitutional mandate of thorough and efficient, whether, uh, which side of the line that falls on, but it's very close to me. Uh, I don't mean to digress, but we'll see very shortly on the question of gay marriage, whether the current New Jersey Supreme Court uh, adopts Archibald Cox's view or, or makes an actual determination of its own. You can take the Cox view too far. I mean, in his view, I think uh, Brown versus Board of Education might never have been decided. And I'm, I'm not saying, by the way, um, none of us knows what the Supreme Court is about to do on gay marriage, but I'm not sure that that falls on the impermissible side of the courts action on the Cox analysis as I would apply it. Um, do you think that today's court could or would issue a decision of the magnitude of Robinson versus Cahill or Mount Laurel? Uh, oh, today's court I think would. I mean, I, I, um, I think Deborah Ports is, is um, a creative balanced, brilliant jurist and a good administrator. And I think by and large the court uh, uh, 
upholds the traditions of the New Jersey Supreme Court, which since the Constitution was amended in 1947 was you know, has always been regarded as one of the best state Supreme Courts in the country. I guess you could argue whether it's as good as the Weintraub Court was or, or the Willens Court was, and, you know, there may be qualitative differences, uh, particularly justice to justice, but on balance, it's still a very strong state Supreme Court, widely respected, and, and I think very powerful within our system, and I don't think they'd hesitate to make a broad-based, uh, uh, constitutionally permissible de decision, nor should they. Looking back to that Robinson Cahill uh, decision, is there something the court could have done, in your view, other than ordering spending equalized? Could they have uh, created 21 county school districts or something else uh, other than just saying you got to spend more? Yes. Uh, they could have done what they've done in, in several other cases involving uh, discrimination issues in education, which is to compel the Commissioner of State Education to, Commissioner of Education, to uh, devise and propose a plan for meeting the thorough and efficient constitutional mandate. Um, instead of um, predicating their decision that it wasn't being met on a funding issue. And I think that would have put it back in the hands. It looks very easy for me to say this uh, 30 years later um, and with the benefit of what we've gone through since. Uh, but in a number of later uh, decisions involving um, discrimination in education, the court did just that. It, it returned the case to the uh, Commissioner of Education for um, the development of a solution. Ultimately, it was going to wind up before the court again in all probability anyway. But it would have been on a record that I think would have been more respectful of the administrative institutions that have a higher level of expertise in some of these very difficult issues than the court can be thought to have. The uh, income tax becomes law. Brendan Byrne is vilified. Uh, you just told us about the cutting the ribbon at the Meadowlands racetrack. Uh, for those who know the more recent history of the state, is it uh, of a similar uh, degree, or is it even worse than what greeted Jim Florio after he hiked taxes 15 years later? That's a good question. Uh, I think um, comparable in order of magnitude, but I think the reaction to Florio was worse. People didn't like Jim Florio. Uh, you know, I don't. I don't understand. I mean, I understand that. I don't agree with it. Um, in some ways, Florio seemed to relish what he did. And, and I think because he believed that it was necessary, he believed that he was fixing some fiscal irresponsibility that had existed in the previous administration. And I think Jim Florio reminds me of Bill Bradley in that regard. He thinks you can be honest uh, with the public about those kinds of issues and that they'll accept that. In reality, I think he underestimated the cynicism of the public about those issues. Um, Governor Byrne, in contrast, didn't seem to enjoy what he had to do. It wasn't something that he came across as being um, an enthusiastic partisan champion of it. He wasn't doing it because it was the right thing to do in a sense. He was doing it because he had this pressure put on him by the court, which he did not disagree with. He never showed any disrespect to the court, but it was about meeting a constitutional mandate as prescribed by the Supreme Court. To that degree, I think probably people did not um, react as strongly to Byrne as they did to Florio. Proof of the pudding is, I guess, Brendan got reelected and, and Jim Florio didn't. Did you attend the oral argument on the school closing case? I, th I believe I did. Uh, did you participate in the strategy on the argument? To some degree, although um, the, the Attorney General's office under Bill Hyland and Bob Del Tuvo was fairly independent about its representation of the state in those. They would they would entertain to a degree.
the thoughts that I would pass along to them in my position from the governor's office, but it was their, it was their briefing. Executive their secretary at that time? I think I was executive secretary at the time or, or counsel at both. Um, you say that uh, Jim Florio seemed to relish getting his taxes passed. What was the mood uh, within the burn inner circle after the tax, after this three-year fight finally succeeded and the, and the tax was passed? Relief was huge, but I think we were all depressed. I, I think most of us believed that this heroic act at great cost and to the diminution of a lot of other initiatives that the governor wanted to do would be the end of his political career. And there were a few of us who began to think about how we could make that not be the end of his political career. So, you know, we began to have some internal meetings about how do we mitigate the impact of this? Or even better, is there a way to leverage this into something positive rather than than negative. And I don't remember whose idea it was, whether it was Leon's or somebody in Treasury who came up with the idea of the rebate uh, check being sent out with the governor's signature on it. I, I thought, frankly, again, another instance where I was wrong, that that was hokey and would be, um, would be the source of, uh, you know, it's like the Con Ed $3 rebate a couple of months ago to, I mean, now to the outage last month. It's an insult to people. Uh, but there's another bad, bad piece of judgment by John Degan. Um, it turned out to, to help. But by and large, it was um, relief, awe of the governor for the role he had in getting it done. Tremendous respect for his courage in doing it. But a belief widespread that he had uh, done the right thing and probably ended his career. Uh, you, you talk about courage, uh, Dick Leon in these interviews has uh, said that the measure of a politician is uh, the difficulty of the fights that he takes on. Would you agree with that statement? Yes, and, and uh, Governor Byrne took on several of them. You know, he, I wrote a memo to him at the end of his second term or before I left it, uh, suggesting to him that the, th the theme in both his terms was um, his ability to draw a line in the sand on issues that were critically important to him. Just a handful of them. The Pinelands comes to mind. Um, and, and, and simply not to budge. You know, just don't um, give it up. And um, it worked in virtually every instance at, at great cost. But it was an in-your-face um, definition of the critical issues and then a willingness to hold firm. I think Dick put it better than I could. I mean, it, it is the measure of, uh, and on that measure, he was a spectacular governor. Were you one of the handful of optimists who thought that Byrne could be reelected? You know, I get credit for that. The reality is I wasn't sure he could win. I was positively certain he should run. Why? Um, for, t for two reasons. One was a, a kind of a banal political reason. Um, even if he lost, I thought he'd have a role in choosing the next state Democratic chairman and being an influence on the shape and direction of the party for the next couple of years. Um, secondly, I thought he deserved to go down fighting. It sounds kind of hokey, but um, he, had, he had done the right thing. He had stood up for what he believed in and, you know, in the way I grew up, you don't run away from that fight, you, you, you fight it to the end. And I thought there was a remote chance that he could win. Other than you, who else thought that? Well, I'm sure there were others. Uh, uh, I think people like Dan Gaby believed that. Um, what was Gaby's role? Gaby's role was he was one of the wise men of the administration. He was an outside advisor. Uh, Gene Byrne believed it. Um, but Gaby was an advertising man. He was an advertising guy, and th there were some other people who told me s since, and, I, and 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 refreshed my recollection. Judges and like people who weren't then judges became judges later, who uh, believed he could win. But 
you know, I, it, was a, it was a difficult time. Nobody wants to tell a governor that he can't win. Nobody wants to be seen by the governor who's got another year in office that, um, that they're a, a pessimist about it. Um, you know, I, I remember going to a cocktail party and uh, I, I was looking for anybody who would say anything favorable about Governor Byrne. The next morning, I would tell him. My, one of my self-imposed uh, missions was to convince him that he could win by sharing stories with him about people I thought he would respect that, um, that thought he could win. So I went to a uh, cocktail party and there was a prominent lawyer in North there, a fellow I still respect, Howard Rosen, um, who told me that he thought Byrne was an example of a courageous governor, that he deserved to win and that he could win. And Howard was, you know, capable of influencing a lot of people and um, raising some money and, you know, was a person we respected. And, and I'll always remember, I hope he doesn't mind my telling this story, I went to see Governor Byrne next morning and on some issue and I said, gee, I was with Howard Rosen last night. He's signed him up. He's on board. And, and the governor, she said, that's interesting. That afternoon or the next day, Howard Rosen publicly endorsed Paul Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I heard about that from the governor, <laughs> but I, I the, the precipitous nature in terms of time was amazing. The, the governor sent me down to, I'm not sure why me by the way, to uh, visit with Peter Hart, the pollster, on the day after Jimmy Carter was inaugurated as president, because we were all going down for the inauguration. We didn't have enough money to commission the poll, and I think it was done by the, uh, either the NJEA or the, I don't know, it was Al Wirf and the AFSCME union, and uh, that, Brent, Brendan still has a copy of that poll. I think I do, too. Uh, Peter Hart told me that he had never before in his public career seen a public official less likely to get reelected. He had 17% of the Democrats polled in a primary, and when asked who would they vote for as a second choice, only 5% additional joint burn. So he had 22% under the most favorable circumstances. Um, and Hart said there was not a chance in the world that this guy could get reelected. And I went back and reported those results to Charlie, uh, I think Charlie Carello was still there. Um, and, I, and I was told I should meet with the governor in uh, Morvan and brief him on the, on the outcome of the poll. This is something I really didn't want to do, and it was inconsistent with my own sort of agenda at the time, which was to, to bolster him, to get him, you know, because I think in truth, if you, I don't know what he'd say if you asked him, uh, but I, he was down too. Um, yeah, now, I, I remember I dreaded that meeting. I, I thought about all night how I could present it in the most optimistic terms, but there weren't any. So I thought I was going to deliver him a, you know, death sentence. And um, not me personally, just repeating what I had heard. Well, time after time, each point I'd make, the governor would say, but you're not thinking of this. Or he didn't ask that question. Or, well, you know, that question was designed to el elicit a negative response. He was himself, was the, fir was the first sign I think I recall seeing of him that he wasn't finished. He wouldn't accept the results of the poll. So this time frame was right after the inauguration of Jimmy Carter. It so it was January 77. of 77. Right. Um, let's talk about the year, the re-election year. Uh, Let me, can I tell you one story that I, I, I kind of like to memorialize because I've told it a few times and it may be because of um, what it ultimately turned out for me and I'll try and give you the condensed version. But in February, the governor convened a meeting at the Princeton Club in New York to get advice from his key folks on whether he ought to run for re-election. Clearly had not indicated to anyone of us what his own personal decision was. I don't think he had made it. And the people in the room were uh, David Hart, uh, Peter Hart rather, um, David, um, the name of his media, Garth, um, uh, Garth um, Dick Leone and Caden and Sagner and uh, I think Charlie Carella was there. Um, there were about 12 people in the room. So he had the pollster, the media people. Um, his closest policy advisors and, and a couple of the people who would raise the money if they could. And um, everyone was going to be asked around the table after the analysis given by Peter Hart of his poll what their position was. And I was at the meeting, but clearly the most junior person, so I went last. And I thought I had an agreement with Lou Caden, who had 
preceded me as governor's counsel that he was going to support urging the governor to run for re-election. But one by one, everyone for different reasons. Caden out of the administration. Caden was out of the administration, but a key, still a key advisor, respected by the governor. Um, one by one, we went around the table, and it was uniform for various reasons, though, that he shouldn't run, couldn't win at least. And um, Lou, as best of my recollection, um, just before I was to go, looked across the table and looked, looked me in the eye and shook his head as if to suggest he had changed his mind and then made an argument that the governor probably couldn't win. Um, and I think said it shouldn't run. Um, but this time, the, I, I actually thought the governor was teary. And um, I made an impassioned argument that he ought to run for the reasons I articulated earlier. Done the right thing, go down fighting, you know, don't pack it up and, and leave um, and pick the next state chairman and see if we can't shape the party, at least for a while. He concluded the meeting, didn't indicate one way or the other what, which way he was leaning. In uh, sometime early in April, I think, this is a story that I don't think a lot of people know, um, Ann Klein, who was the Commissioner of Human Services, half his cabinet wanted to run, by the way, and half of them were meeting with state uh, county chairman around the state trying to solicit interest in their candidacy. In fact, a couple of them did run. And um, Ann Klein, a woman of an intense, passionate feelings about public policy issues, um, intransigent in her views, articulate uh, woman, commissioned a poll. And as I recall it, the poll showed that Ann could win the primary and is more likely to win the primary than Brendan Byrne. But it also showed that under a certain set of circumstances, Brendan could win the primary. What did Ann do with that poll? She sat down with Brendan and told him the results. That was an enormously generous thing to do. If she hadn't told him, other than the Ask Me Commission poll by Peter Hart, he wouldn't have had any real polling data that suggested he could win. He came back from that meeting with her the next day or maybe that afternoon and told me about the poll. By this time, he knew where, I mean, we had had the Princeton meeting, knew where I was coming from, so, um, and I, Personally, I think that was a turning point in his, in his decision, and it was because of the uh, integrity of a woman who was serving as a cabinet officer because he appointed her but had run against him in the primary in 1973, um, doing the right thing. One thing I'm hearing in this answer or in this anecdote is that polls really are important to politicians. More to some than others. You know, that po the polling was important uh, for him in terms of whether he should run and whether he could win. I don't think polls ever dictated to him what position he should take on an issue. And that's the flaw of modern polling. I think political people today use them to define their political, their, their public policy positions. And that, that's, a, you know, that, that's a perversion of democracy, I think. Byrne would never have done that. But if a po political leader's ratings are in the tank, uh, some of us like to think that they re recognize that as sort of the cost of doing business and it'll change over time. And I'm hearing from this uh, anecdote that it can really be demoralizing. It can be demoralizing politically, um, more so in the first term than in the second, by the way. Because <laughs> you don't have to finish my, uh, my story, by the way. I, the governor and I never spoke about that dinner again until uh, the morning after this amazing comeback win in the general election. And, you know, we had begun to see it coming in the last four or five days of the campaign, but we couldn't quite believe that he was going to win. Any, any one. And the press conference was national news. So about the, the, the general election. The general election. I'll, I'll leap forward to that. We can talk about the primary if you want. But the, the morning after the general election, um, I'm not sure how I made it to the office because I don't think I stopped partying un until I got to the office. Uh, uh, he called me into the office. He said, what was the date of the meeting at the Princeton Club? And I said, I have no idea. And he said, well, go ask Edie, which is his sister-in-law was his appointment secretary. So I did, and I came back, and I said, whatever it was, I think it was February 16th. Um, and he said thanks. And then he went out and had this press conference and announced there were two people who had urged him to run for re-election. Gene Byrne 
and John Degnan at a dinner at the Princeton Club in February. And that was the first time I realized how, how much those remarks must have meant to him. It was very flattering. That afternoon I asked him if I could be Attorney General. <laughs> he said no. <laughs> you became Attorney General. I did. Over, uh, it took me about six weeks of <laughs> begging, cajoling, persuading, and other people saying no. Bro. We should get to that. But uh, before we leave uh, the tax issue, any other anecdotes uh, in your recollection? Oh, there, there, there are a lot of anecdotes, uh, uh, but none, none worthy of uh, memorializing, I think. Uh, any other issues that you were active? Let me, let me just say, I guess before I get off that, the, the, the talent and um, uh, steadfastness of the Treasurer's Office stands out, and headed by Dick Leone, stands out in my, my mind in that battle. I mean, Dick was, Dick was himself reviled by most legislators. I mean, he was the, uh, the Rasputin, I guess, uh, uh, but brilliant indefatigable, tireless, um, never letting us lose, lose sight of the, uh, the policy merits of the tax and, and any number of times when I think people of a more political nature were trying to persuade the governor to back away from the issue, or let somebody else take the lead, um, challenge the court to do what it might if the legislature didn't respond. You know, Leon would, uh, would be the most articulate voice. Uh, we couldn't let that happen. So, give me a chance to. That was my perspective. Um, any other issues you were active on in the first term that we haven't discussed? Yeah, I'm sure there were, but um, sitting here today without having done any uh, kind of refreshing my recollection by checking records, the income tax stands out. Uh, Atlantic City. You know, I was um, involved uh, in the, in the um, decision. I was not a big supporter of um, casinos in Atlantic City personally. I didn't believe it was an appropriate way to revitalize the city. Had several discussions with the governor about it. Um, it was obvious to me he had strong feelings that gambling was not quite as bad an activity as I thought it was. Um, used to use the analogy all the time of um, trading the stock options or stock. And isn't that a form of uh, legalized betting? Uh, talked about the frustration he had as a prosecutor trying to wipe out numbers when in reality uh, there was no way you were going to wipe out people's wanting to have some fun and taking a bet against a better future. Um, even if you wished that they had applied those efforts to more practical these are his uh, thoughts. These are his thoughts. Um, he never convinced me, but what he did convince me was that he was going there, and he was the governor, and he was elected, so if he was going there, I was going to go there. I didn't play a role. I played a role in the development of the legislation and the language for the constitutional amendment, um, but there was, a t there was a group of people, I think Bob Martinez in the AG's office headed that up, and uh, uh, Al Luciani and very knowledgeable guys and you know I was convinced if we had to do it they were doing it the right way so I played a role in those and I went to the meetings but I since I wasn't the champion of the initiative I didn't um, play a dominant role in it. I've been on any transportation issues? On most of them I played a role because um, I can't remember whether I mentioned this the last time the governor's uh, Luke Caden's philosophy of how to run the government was to create policy specialists um, among the assistant counsel. So in addition to being a lawyer, you were the person who was going to be expected to be an independent source of advice to the governor on issues relating to a particular department. And uh, transportation was one, one of mine, and um, insurance and banking were another. For a very short time, I was deputy commissioner of transportation um, when a very talented guy um, came out of Harvard, I think Manny Carballo, was the deputy commissioner under Alan Sagner. And Alan was a great commissioner in the sense that he played the appropriate public face of the department and represented their interests pretty passionately to the governor, really became a believer in urban transportation and the way in which the state needed to uh, move in that direction. Manny was one of these professional 
um, public administrators, just an incredibly talented guy. And Caden had, uh, um, and, and Leon, I think, had unlimited faith in Manny. So Manny was there to kind of be the policy backbone to a very talented, articulate commissioner. Um, and Manny died, uh, no, he didn't die. Manny has since died, sadly, but he left government for, I got told I was going over to be deputy commissioner of transportation. I think I arrived on a Monday. I'd been in that office all the time um, because I was trying to learn what was going on in the department. Over the weekend, they had cut the office in half and erected a wall to diminish the size of the deputy commissioner's office, which was, I thought, a pretty potent message when I walked in. And the, Who did that? Um, no, it wasn't Sagner. It was the, I don't think yeah, Alan even knew about it. It was, I'm not sure Alan supported my going there or not, though, because he knew I was such a burn loyalist. And not that Alan wasn't, he was, but, you know, it's one thing to be a cabinet officer and run your own shop. It's another one to be a cabinet officer and have somebody very close to the governor as your number two. Um, I don't know who did it. I don't think it was Alan. But the next thing I got was a uh, multi million dollar contract for a road that I needed to be signed within the first 90 minutes of the, my first day. <laughs> and I remember, I think it took me to lunchtime to call Caden and ask him if I could come back. <laughs> this, this was not a job I wanted to do. Um, and I did. I did. Elaborate on that for those who might under, not understand why you didn't want to be involved in a you know, multi million dollar highway contract. The previous uh, transportation secretaries had gotten themselves into some trouble. Um, in contract awards and not knowing the history of the contract and how it, you know, the bidding process, whether there was a bidding process. Um, I knew Alan Sagan was honest and I, I knew that he would have done, done all he, he could do. I just didn't feel like I had the, uh, uh, the requisite level of knowledge to do, so to do the Kate job well. Caden let me come back. Uh, right away? Pretty soon. I don't think I was there longer than a week. <laughs> it wasn't too soon for me. But transportation was part of your yes. uh, portfolio. Uh, what was the major transportation initiative of the first burn term? If I have my timing right, I think it may have been the de-designation of Route 95 and the reallocation of the federally available funds to urban mass transit. That's a hugely controversial decision, just like Tox Island was a hugely controversial decision in the first term. and. Um, Sagner was a passionate believer in urban mass transit and a strong proponent. Now, the, you know, 95 then, it's, everyone knows it now as the turnpike, but 95 back then would have uh, run on a parallel track to the west of the New Jersey turnpike and roughly parallel, I think, Route 206 going north in New Jersey. And, um, but population growth in New Jersey during the 70s was essentially flat. And it's turned out probably to have been overemphasized in, in light of the demographic patterns of the way the state has developed since then. But there was a compelling argument that, the, that 95 was not as necessary as plowing that money into New Jersey mass transit. And that was an issue. I, I happen to believe Sagner had the right point of view. I was not an alternative source of advice to the governor on that. I, I agreed with the department's position. And so now 95 is the turnpike. Yes, and that was the consequence of that decision. I think it was then, it was, it was designated as 95, but it, the, the federal interstate transportation map included a building of a parallel route 95, which would have become I-95, and the turnpike would have just stayed the turnpike. How about the penal code? Uh, were you involved in the penal code in the first term? I was, um, uh, as a lawyer. Um, without a criminal law background, but this was also an issue that the governor felt very strongly about. And um, so I was involved in a lot of the substantive review of, um, of draft legislation and, and Well, I know that the penal code was completely overhauled in the second burn term, but how about in the first term? Was but no, that if it was the second term, that's when I thought... I think it was like 78, 79... Okay, uh, so then, then I was mistaken in my recollection. I was involved in it then as an attorney general, um, but I thought it was earlier. I t the Parole Act was, was overhauled in 79, that I recall. I think it was 78 that the 
penal code was rewritten. I may be wrong. Let me tell you why I think it was earlier. Because the, you know, one of the one of the great things I thought that penal code revision did was to decriminalize consent, consenting activity, consenting sexual activity among adults. So basically, wiped the sodomy laws off. The, they were archaic and never enforced. And um, I remember the governor asking me to go testify before a Senate panel on the penal code. I guess maybe it was early 78. Maybe it was still being debated then. Marty Greenberg was the chair. And uh, I was a young attorney general. And this was a pretty controversial issue. And, and I'll remember because I always remember because the governor said to me, I've talked to Marty. This is going to be a non-controversial hearing. You're going to get a statement of very few questions. Just go do it because the attorney general should speak on this issue. And three minutes into my uh, text, uh, a woman with rosary bead in one hand and a placard in the other got up in the back of the Senate panel room and called me a sodomite and started ranting and raving, had to be removed from the, the room. This was my first public testimony as attorney general. <laughs> and uh, um, I remember it pretty vividly. Uh, the Pinelands, was that a second term? It was a second term initiative. And um, <clears throat> God, I still remember, I didn't even know what the Pinelands w were. Um, I remember the governor calling the meeting in Morvan, and he had read John McPhee's book, and of course he was a friend of McPhee's, and he told us that this was going to be a central theme of the second term, and that we all had to read the book. He had McPhee in the room, and that we were going to get it done. Um, and it was another example of that drawing a line in the sand. Uh, he j and we've talked a little bit before about how he did it. I mean, he was intractable in his commitment that that would get done. I wonder how many writers have ever been in the room when a politician said, I'm going to implement the idea in this man's book. That's unusual. Yeah, I can't think of another president, but I, of course I only work for one governor. Um, let's talk about getting Byrne reelected, if we can. Uh, Uh, you were one of the few optimists, um, or maybe optimist isn't even the right term. For Probably that. not the right term for me. I'd like to I'd like to say that's true, but you know I I believed he should run. I thought there was a chance he could win, but not a great one. So I, I don't think I could fairly be called an optimist. Uh, the two key advisors of the first <coughs> term, Dick Leone and Lou Caden. They, they left at the end of the first term, I believe. Is that because they didn't think there was hope? No, I think, um, you know, Lou, Lou was an enormously talented guy. He left probably m midway through the first term, and it, it wasn't about the election. He just, you know, he was commuting down from New York City and had young kids and um, had lots of things he could do, and he's had a great career since in New York, and he was just ready to stop the grind of the of the day-to-day. -day. Dick left a little later. Um, I'm not sure exactly why uh, um, I wasn't a confidant of his at the time, and I don't recall that he explained to me why I thought it was a, I thought his leaving, though, was a critical uh, loss for the government. Um, so, the, you know, and what Dick said to the governor at the time himself privately about running or not, I'll, I'll let him answer. But it's safe to say not many people were urging him to run for re-election. I think he knew after that April Paul and Ann Klein gave him. Very shrewd. He, I was living. C cabinet officer thinking about running against the governor that appointed him. To me, that was treachery. How many of them were doing it? Joe Hoffman was doing it in the Department of Labor. Um, Ann Klein was thinking about it. Some others, uh, you know, there, there were lots of rumors always that Bill Hyland was talking to people about doing it. Um, and I think there were one or two others. Um, they obviously never talked to me about it. Uh, you know, I would have, uh, I, I just would have done whatever I could to uh, cut them off. Uh, Byrne, I think, had a sense that the more people who ran against him, the better off he'd be. So, while well, he personally resented it, and, you know, I, I, to this day, I think Joe Hoffman is on his short list of people who, uh, <laughs> he's, a, he's a pretty forgiving guy, more forgiving than I am, but, but I think Joe Hoffman's still on his list. Um, he didn't prevent them from doing it. Um, and uh, he wound up running against, what, seven candidates perhaps in the primary? 
um, and including uh, the one we thought most formidable, Paul Jordan, uh, the mayor of Jersey City, who shortly before the primary, though, uh, his designated successor for mayor in Jersey City lost the election, and Paul lost his power base. And um, ultimately, we talked him out of, of the race. I had a role Do in that. Do you remember who that designated successor was? I can't remember who the candidate was. If it, it was Tommy Smith who no, won no, the election. No, it wasn't Tommy Smith. Who won the election. Yes. Yeah. The, it, you know, Jordan, if you remember, was the reform mayor of Jersey City. and in, in fact, was, I think. Um, you wouldn't call Tommy, <laughs> Tommy Smith, of happy memory, a, uh, a reform candidate. It was a return to the old Jersey City politics, and Jordan was humiliated in the loss, uh, unfairly so. I think he was a good mayor. Was Leon's departure seen by some as uh, the rats leaving the sinking ship? Oh, yeah, I'd never called Dick Leon a rat, but um, it was certainly was seen by me and I think a lot of people in the office as an indicator that you know even Dick didn't really think he could win re-election, which was what made Dick Leon's coming back to run the campaign so uh, uh, impactful. You know, when, when uh, a lot of people don't remember, Bob Torricelli, young guy in the governor's office, leaves to go run the campaign day to day. But Dick Leon came back to be the chairman of the campaign. If I had to strategize it, Bob Torricelli and Henry Luther were the co-COOs of the campaign. Shows you I've got to be a corporate guy, right? Chief Operating Officer. Uh, Dick Leon was the chairman and CEO. And every morning in Princeton in the headquarters, I'm sorry, in Lawrenceville in the headquarters of the campaign, um, most mornings Dick would be there to run the, the daily meeting. And I would stop in on my way from Princeton to Trenton for the meeting and then go on to, to the State House. Um, but Dick's coming back to the insiders of the administration was a clear sign that A, the campaign would be well run, and B, Leon wouldn't have done it if he didn't think there was a chance of winning. Uh, Torsell and Luther both were assistant counsels, or no? Bob was. Um, I'm not sure. He, I guess he had his law degree at the time. He was an assistant legislative counsel and reported to Jerry English. Um, Henry Luther was executive secretary. Was no. Well, he ran the lottery commission, and then a, a short time he served as executive secretary. He, and he he may have left the executive secretary's job to go do it. That's right, because I was then chief counsel. When Henry, and having been executive secretary, and when Henry left to become executive secretary, to become uh, the, one of the people running the campaign, we didn't replace him as executive secretary. I took both jobs on, um, and did that during the pendency of the election. Is it, do you recall, or and is it possible to uh, generalize how the press regarded Brendan Byrne during this re-election year, or how they treated yeah, him? That's a good question. Um, you know, a lot of the press had. And some of the more influential, I don't want to mention names, but I thought some of the more influential members of the press had kind of written Brendan off. Frankly, didn't realize he was as smart as he is. And maybe they had been led to believe that by some folks, I'm not sure. But, you know, the, the thinking of some of the press was without Leon, he wouldn't have a thought of his own. Uh, and that. Uh, if he if he was a marionette and he was you know being run by a few people in the administration and totally underestimated the guy i don't think they really thought he had a credible chance of winning but by and large i think they treated him reasonably kindly because they knew he <laughs> you know it's sort of um, it's being kind to the person because the next time you see him maybe the last time you see him uh i don't think they had, think he had a chance but i think generally the press coverage was fair and in the end, by the way, I thought the press did a remarkably good job after the primary of on the income tax of not letting the Republicans and, and Ray Bateman get away with their, their publicly uh, stated position of um, abandoning the income tax without answering questions about what the replacement was. And I think the press had a role in, in that. Uh, was there any conscious strategy in the Byrne campaign to keep all of the primary rivals in 
in order to divide up the vote, or was that just uh, good fortune? What did you it was work a, at? It? it was some some place between good fortune and actively trying to keep them in. Uh, to the best of my recollection, with the exception of Paul Jordan, we made no effort to get anybody out. You know, Jordan was the other good government guy in there. If you remember how Brendan won his first election, he was, you know, mentioned on the DeCalvacanti tapes as the one person in New Jersey that the mob couldn't buy. And it was post Watergate, and he ran as a reformer. Um, we didn't want to lose that high ground of, and then, and 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 then it fit nicely with his image of what he had done in, as governor, which is the courageous decision he made to support income tax, the apology he made, um, at David Garth's insistence in a famous um, television ad of, uh, for having said just before he was elected he didn't see the need for the income tax in the foreseeable future. When did that ad run, do you think? I think it aired in the primary, um, but it certainly aired in the general election, and it was a pivotal ad because I've mentioned this before, cut me off, but the, the governor thought about this issue like a lawyer, and it was a flaw. When he was asked, and I was there at least a dozen times in the first administration in meetings, why he had said he didn't see the need for the income tax in the foreseeable future as a candidate only a few weeks before a general election, he was destined to win. I mean, he was not going to lose to Charlie Sandman in the first um, election. What possessed him to say that? I don't know. Uh, I wasn't involved in the campaign at the time and, and didn't have any role in it. Uh, and, um, but he, in explaining it, he would say, that's ex not exactly what I said. They would pull the transcript out, he always kept the transcript, and he would parse out the words. Now, if you read this word with that word, it reminds me a little bit of Bill Clinton's, you know, what depends on what the meaning of is is. Well, nobody believed it. it you know, everybody heard, I do not see a need for an income tax in the foreseeable future. I think it was virtually a, a condition to David Garth's willingness to work on the re-election campaign that the governor apologized for that. Garth felt passionate that this technical explanation of I really didn't say what you thought I said was not going to wash with the public and that you better apologize. And I took the governor. It wasn't an easy decision for him to reach. I mean, he was a good lawyer. Uh, but I, but it, was a, it was a turning point. Uh, to, to the best of your, of your recollection, what did the governor say in that ad? What did he say? He's, he said, sometimes governors have to do hard things. And I understand that it's not popular. And I understand that I may have inadvertently led you to believe that I wouldn't have to do this. When I became governor, I realized I had to, and um, we did. It wasn't really an apology. It was kind of an explanation. Uh, what contact did you have with Garth? At that point, very little. Um, you know, David Garth only spoke to the governor and Dick Leon, and he, he wouldn't have condescended to talk to me. He wouldn't, he wouldn't have known who I was. How significant was Garth's advice? I, I thought it was pivotal. Uh, I wouldn't say it was the one decisive uh, piece of advice, but I, you know, I, I think Garth had a great influence on the governor. He could persuade him in a way that those of us without Garth's experience and sort of persona couldn't. Uh, and I generally thought Garth was giving him great advice. Yeah. Any, anything else come to mind that Garth uh, imparted to Byrne? Um, some self-confidence. I, I, I think during the campaign, I think Garth began to believe he could win. Um, um, and, and Garth would be very influential on him. He won the primary with a very low number. I think 31 percent, but that may be too high. Um, I remember being ecstatic the night of the primary. And, you know, it, there were a lot of us. It was a lonely primary campaign. I mean, it was folks in the governor's office who had left to go run the campaign. Um, we were, it was a tight-knit group, zealots, probably. Um, but we knew that we didn't have a broad base of support, and we were very disappointed by the number of people who didn't come around in the primary who we thought should have. And um, so we were elated and yet depressed.
and we all met for breakfast, a bunch of us, on the, some diner on Route 1 about 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. after um, the morning of the day after the election. And, uh, you know, there weren't many of us around the table who really believed we were, could win in November. And yet we were going into this long summer's fight for it. Now, every bit is committed and zealous, but so you, the elation was tempered by a realistic um, realization that when you win by that margin, um, it doesn't bode well for the November election. And we all liked and respected Ray Bateman, by the way. Did he have a primary? Or was yes. He? And if I'm, if I'm right in my recollection, he beat Tom Kane in that primary. That's right. That's right. And frankly, I thought that was the right outcome I, 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 for the Republicans. I, I, if I were the governor, I would rather have run against Tom Kane. Um, but Bateman, we knew, would be a good candidate. Bateman had more stature at that time than Kane. He was a little, a little heftier. He, yeah, uh, a little more um, scar tissue and uh, uh, a little more savvy as a politician. Tom Kane became, you know, a, a very savvy politician later. Probably was then. We were probably underestimating him. Um, but I thought, I thought the Republicans had produced their best candidate. From the vantage point of today, we would look back on you all at that time and say that you were liberals. Um, is that what you felt like at that time? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I, I, used to, I used to wonder about that at the time. Um, I did then, and I still think of myself as a, as a liberal, on, particularly on social issues. Um, but by and large, I think the I think particularly the first term of the Byrne administration was about practical politics and not ideological politics, and that we weren't consistently orthodox ideological liberals. Um, the the practical necessities of running a government in and getting as much done as we could with this looming, you know, overlay of the income tax. Um, led to some decisions which I thought were inconsistent with a liberal outlook, um, but necessary at the time. Um, what, what won it for Brendan Byrne in 77 in the general election? A few things. Uh, he was a terrific candidate before 9 o'clock at night. Um, you know, he, if you didn't get him to bed by 9.30, um, you know, it was not a happy day the next day. But he, I said that facetiously, he turned out to be an enthusiastic campaigner and a great leader. T two, I think Ray Bateman made a fatal mistake in the decision to, which I know based on conversations I've had with him since he didn't want to get to and really didn't believe in, which is that the income tax should be abolished and rolled back. And he worked with uh, Bill Simon to come up with this famous Bateman-Simon plan to replace the income tax revenues, which was so fundamentally flawed. You know, a first grader who knew anything about state, e state economy could debunk it. And, and uh, Brendan dubbed it the uh, BS plan. I still remember the press conference where he used that. And, Another piece of bad advice from Degna and I urged him not to use the BS thing because I thought it was unbecoming of a governor to use um, even, an a even an acronym for a uh, word that had four letters in it. And uh, he went out and used it. And it was a, a pivotal turning point in part because the press took it. And each time um, Ray Bateman thereafter was asked about that plan, it was always followed by a question of, well, how can you abolish it? It's X billions of dollars. Where is that going to come from? And there was a great moment in the debate in the fall when, um, if I told you the story, stop me, no. where um, I'll always remember because there were three Holiday Inns at the time around the uh, Newark Airport. We were, the governor was always a little bit late. This was a publicly televised debate, though, and it's against Bateman. I think it was the first one. And even, even Governor Byrne was nervous, and he rarely got nervous. I thought he was nervous. Anyway, long story short, we get there about five minutes late and, and about two-thirds of the way through the debate, one of the moderators asked um, Bateman a question about how we would replace the revenues from the income tax. And Ray gave a meandering, non-responsive answer. And the format of the debate was that the governor then had 60 seconds to answer. And they turned to the governor and he said, I'll cede my 60 seconds if Senator Bateman will really answer that question. 
camera pans back on Ray Bateman, who instead of saying, uh, give him my answer, meanders for another 60 <laughs> seconds. It was a disaster for Bateman, and it was read that way by the press, and it was a brilliant tactic on Byrne, and it had not been practiced. Uh, I think another critical element in the election was, uh, and again, I, I think I probably was wrong in my judgment about this. There was a uh, state police conducted four-way on a guy named Joe Lordi, who was a very talented prosecutor in Essex County, followed Brendan Byrne as prosecutor, I think. And Joe had been appointed as chairman of the Casino Control Commission. And yet Joe had grown up in Newark. And so I don't think in his generation you grew up in Newark without rubbing elbows with some people who later became criminals. And the uh, four-way had some unflattering details about that. Byrne knew this guy very well. Uh, had worked with him in the prosecutor's office, you know, knew his values and his integrity, and appointed him notwithstanding the four-way. The state police, though, leaked the four-way. There are certain state police officers leaked the four-way to the Republican campaign, we learned later, to a certainty. And it was released by them to the press. And because in, at, at, that, at that point, um, Byrne was sort of Mr. Integrity in Atlantic City, and had made very uh, strong public statements about keeping the mob out of Atlantic City, we thought it might be a fatal blow. Uh, the knowledge that he had appointed a casino control commissioner who had some of these uh, peccadilloes in his background, and they weren't anything more than that. In reality, that turned out to be, it mobilized the Italian-American community in New Jersey like I've never seen before to defend Joe Lordi and to extol the merits of a Brendan Byrne who would appoint a guy he knew to be honest notwithstanding some hearsay information in a state police report that he might not be. It fed into the image of a guy who had integrity, who would make the right decision rather than the political decision. Those three things, the quality of Byrne as a candidate, the Bateman-Simon plan, and to a lesser degree this um, Republican tactical mistake of leaking the four-way, um, began to change the momentum. So by mid-September, maybe late September, early October, we really could sense that we had a chance. When did you know you would win? Yeah, the day, the 91. Um, it was close. It, it was close. election day, it was close. It, uh, we thought it was close. Um, and if I have my election right, it rained like hell on election day. And there were districts in Jersey City you couldn't access without getting into a rowboat to get to the poll. This is, Jersey City is not a place where, as a Democrat, running for governor. You want people impeded from accessing the polls, maybe multiple times. <laughs> and there was actually an, a, a, a debate going on at Morven that day about whether we could petition the Supreme Court to keep the polls open for a couple of hours later that day uh, to ensure that people got the right to vote. Um, I think we all thought it was that close that, that certainly I did, and I think the governor did. Um, and I spent most of the day at Morven with him that day uh, and, and night. Um, that, that could make the difference. And for me, um, I'd be interested in the governor's uh, answer to, the, to that question. I, I really wasn't confident until just before the polls closed or maybe right after. We began to get information that some of the exit polling data was very positive. We didn't have the sophisticated operation that people have today, though. We're, you know, we were getting fed information during the day uh, that was, was conclusive. Uh, and we all headed up to West Orange for the party.